will. We're going to look at these scriptures again one more time for reiteration's sake. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where, th where thieves break, now watch it, do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Why is it that some people continually have financial difficulties? You ever wonder? You ever wonder why some people always seem to be, if I may say so, as a quote behind the eight ball? You ever wonder, but never can? Let me read you just a couple of scary, uh, sort of like um, uh, statistics about some finances as I preached this morning on a wise investment. Listen to this. Two out of three Americans would struggle to be able to put together a thousand dollars for an emergency. Two out of three. Seventy-six uh, percent of the millennials uh, have no financial literacy whatsoever. Forty-six percent of all Americans do not have any money set aside. Any money set aside. For a rainy day the amount of people over the age of 60 are still trying to pay off student loans and by the way that quadrupled within the last 10 years one out of three Americans only pay the minimum interest payment on their monthly credit card note 50% uh, of people that have student loans listen to this 50% of the people that have student loans fear that they'll never be able to pay them off. Now why? Why is it that some people always seem to have financial difficulties? Why is it that some people seem never to be able to get ahead? Is there some Bible principles we need to look at that could be a help? Well, look at your Bible again. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Here's what we see. Statement number one, everybody has treasure. Everybody has treasure. Everybody does. Uh, now, your treasure may be something that uh, you look at, and it, it may be your car. Maybe that's your treasure. Uh, maybe a house. Maybe that's your treasure. Uh, maybe certain type of clothes. And that's your treasure. Uh, maybe uh, uh, education. You put a lot of money into education. That's your treasure. Uh, maybe your treasure is uh, friendship. That, that's, that's a treasure to some. Uh, maybe your treasure is uh, being able to eat elegant type of food, fancy restaurants. Uh, maybe that's where your treasure is. Uh, maybe your treasure, if you will please, is in buying lots of land. Maybe that's your treasure. Uh, maybe your treasure uh, is what you hold in stocks and bonds. May maybe that's your treasure. But everybody has treasure. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, uh, lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, uh, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, uh, the Bible says where your treasure is. All right, so everybody has treasure. Now, uh, what you do with that treasure is going to make all the difference in the world, but uh, we can't argue with the fact you can't lay something up unless you have it. So God says, and this is uh, written to everyone, uh, he tells us what to do with the treasure. So apparently God believes that you have treasure. All right, and so the Bible says here uh, what we're supposed to do uh, with a portion of that treasure. We'll get into that a little bit later, but we do see this. We see that everybody does have treasure. We see it in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Uh, no man can serve two masters, uh, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, the word mammon there talks about wealth, uh, wealth chasing, if you will please. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. By the way, it doesn't say money is evil. Uh, it, it doesn't say that money is wrong. There, there's nothing wrong tonight with uh, you ha or this morning with you having money. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But when that becomes your first love, 
then it becomes very dangerous. And so God says we have to be careful about that which is mammon. We have to be careful about that which is uh, wealth. Uh, Webster's Dictionary of 1828 defines wealth as that which is prosperity. James chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. All right? And so understand this morning, if, if you have a car, uh, that's God's gift. God's been good to you. Uh, you say, but my car doesn't run well. God's still been good to you. There's many people who don't have a car. Do you understand this morning that if you have clothes, and I'm looking around, and thank God all of you do. But because of that, God's been good to you. You understand this morning that uh, many of you live in an apartment, you live in a trailer, uh, you live uh, uh, in a house, you live in a condo, uh, you, you uh, maybe have two or three houses. Uh, can I tell you, uh, that's God's goodness to you. God's been good to you. Uh, uh, there are people in this room that have two pennies to rub together. There are people in this room uh, that have a bank account. That you have an emergency fund. Uh, if something goes wrong, you're able to cover it because uh, you have over the years learned to put away some money here, put away some money there, and you built an emergency fund for emergency purposes. Can I tell you, uh, even if you don't have much money at all and you do live paycheck to paycheck, uh, don't you thank God you got to pay Paycheck? Don't you thank God that God's been good to you? Uh, most of the people in this room are not uh, 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 famishing. You're, 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 not, uh, you're not dying because you're living in a famine. Most of you in this room, you're growing in the Lord many different ways. You're growing spiritually. Some of you have grown physically. You know, now, wait a minute. It shows God's been good to you. Yeah, most of you could stop off anywhere you want to and be able to go in and buy a hamburger. Most of you could go anywhere you want to and stop by and uh, buy some french fries. God's been good to you. He's been good to you. Uh, most of you in this room could go to the fanciest restaurant and, and, uh, and pay uh, a high price for, <laughs> isn't it funny, isn't it funny? You, you go to these, uh, these uh, restaurants where you pay a little bit and they give you a lot of food. You go to a real fancy restaurant, you pay a lot, and they give you a little food. I have never figured that out. I never think they put a couple of leaves on there and maybe a couple of small trees that they went outside, got for free, you know, and they put it on there and they give it a fancy uh, name and, and they say, you know, this is a $150 plate. The plate's not, e you could break the plate and it wouldn't be worth 150 bucks. Uh, but because of the, uh, uh, you know, the way that we feel, you know, that's a fancy restaurant. McDonald's could be a fancy restaurant if you take your own plate. <laughs> I'm saying this. I'm saying we understand that uh, everyone has treasure. By the way, if you compare America to the countries of the world, we're the richest country in the world. Uh, you take somebody today that's not uh, living uh, in an extravagant house, not in an extravagant neighborhood, uh, somebody, if you would please, that would say that uh, I'm very poor according to American standard, uh, but you compare yourself to the world standard, you're very rich. God's been good to us. God's the one that gave you the food. God's the one that gives you books. Most people, when I walk into their house, they've got books laying around on the shelves, uh, uh, maybe sometimes because they can't fit them all in boxes, okay? But they've got books. God's been good to you. Uh, if you're married, you have a spouse. That's what that's called when you're married. By the way, male and female, married, okay? Can I tell you what? God's been good to you. If you have children, God's been good to you. God's been good to you. Uh, if you have an apartment, I said a moment ago, doesn't matter where you live. God's been good to you. If you live in a pup tent, God's been good to you. If you own one pair of shoes, whether they have holes or not, God's been good to you. If you have your own chair, that's called your chair. We have a chair at my house. It's dad's chair. All of a sudden, kids come over, grandkids come over. I walk in the living room, automatically they get up and they get out of the chair. Why? I didn't ask them. 
It's just that the chair is contoured to my body. So when they sit in it, they get lost. When I sit in it, I become found. Now, can I say this? Can I say God's been good to you? 38 million Americans live paycheck to paycheck. 38 million Americans have no savings, no emergency fund. Uh, they don't have much money to spend. Uh, it is said that uh, if a person has $10, listen to it, if a person has $10 in their pocket with no debt, they're considered, considered wealthy because 25% of the American population does not have that. Did you hear what I said? So 25% of the American population doesn't have enough money to have $10 in their pocket and are debt-free. Most people are carrying debt with very little money in the pocket. Now, can I say this? Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm going to show you a, a way out. Uh, it doesn't matter where you stand. God's been good. Uh, you can look outside. You're breathing uh, air. By the way, you're living in America, greatest country in the world. Can I say God's been good to you? Statement number one, everyone has treasure. Statement number two, uh, everyone will invest their treasure somewhere. Everyone's going to invest their treasure somewhere. Some's going to put it in the stock market. Uh, some's going to put it uh, in lawn care. Uh, some's going to put it in uh, uh, getting their hair done. Uh, some's going to put it in eating in fancy restaurants. Uh, uh, but everybody's going to take and invest uh, their finances, their treasure somewhere. Now, there's only really two locations as far as in a general sense that you can invest your finances, invest your time, invest your treasure uh, one is on earth. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures, uh, uh, it says, upon the earth. So you can invest treasures right here. Right here. Uh, so this is one place you can say, I'm going to put my treasure. Another place is in heaven. Only two locations. Heaven. The Bible says, and lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, depending on how things affect you, mostly is where you lay them up. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The word affection simply means things that affect you, things that entertain you, things that you hold in high opinion. So God says this. He said, so uh, don't let things affect you. You ever see somebody when they buy a new car? They park it on the edge of the parking lot. Why? They don't want somebody to rub it, scratch it, uh, uh, put their personal details on it. So they park it on the other side of the parking lot. Why? It's of high value to them. Uh, don't you think it'd be good this morning if we said we have a high value in Jesus Christ? Don't you think church would be good this morning to say, hey, uh, we see that there's a necessity of laying up treasures in heaven. Uh, by the way, I'm not against you having a nice car. I'm not against you having a retirement. I'm not against you laying up so that you don't be a burden to your children when you get old. Hey, I'm not against it. God's for it too. But what I'm saying, don't get it confused. Uh, don't get uh, so much to this earth uh, that's going to rust, that's going to, somebody's going to break through and steal it. Hey, don't leave God out of the scenario. Here's what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So God said, hey, I'll give you the things. You can have the things. I don't know how many things my dear wife and I has had given to us. I don't know how many things uh, our children has had given to them. Uh, God is good in uh, giving things, but can I tell you, we've got to put it in the right order because he says, seek ye first. You ever see somebody get excited about an offering? All of a sudden, the offering plate gets ready to be passed, and somebody's sitting on the edge of their seat saying, oh, I can't wait. Ooh, I can't wait. Ooh, it's going to be good. Ooh, it's coming. I can feel it. I can smell that usher that normally works my aisle. He's coming. You know, he, he wears the same cologne all the time. 
Well, he's coming. He's getting close. Whoa, I just can't wait. Oh, I just feel it. Oh, and the billfold starts to pop. It starts to uh, uh, all of a sudden get energy and starts to rise up out of the back pocket. And, uh, you know, but, you know, most people don't, what they do is they, they're shoving that billfold back in there. So, whoa, whoa. You know, and, and or, or all of a sudden God speaks to your heart and says, I want you to put that hundred dollar bill in. Come on, God. How about 10? Come on. I'm saying this. I'm saying here's what we understand. Everybody has treasure. Now you're going to invest that treasure somewhere. And God talks about as we invest it in him, here's what he does. He gives a great return. He beats the stock market. He, spe he beats the bonds. Matter of fact, here's what he says, uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7. The Bible says, return on to me, and I will return on to you. So it's up to us to take that first step. Over in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. So here's what happens. Brother Bachman, stand up if you will. Here's what happens. So I, I go, and I'm going to pretend that Dr. Bachman represents the Lord. And so I hear about tithing. I hear about uh, uh, giving. I hear that uh, I'm supposed to give 10% of my gross income. And so it's all new to me. Never heard that before. But if God said it, guess I better do it. By the way, most of the time when we start obeying the Lord, it's not out of happiness. Most of the time we start obeying the Lord, it's out of duty. Come on. Uh, I, I was raised, uh, of course, in a Catholic church. We had uh, Sunday, uh, Saturday night mass, Sunday morning mass, but we didn't have no Sunday night. As far as I can remember, I don't remember there being an emphasis on a Wednesday night. I showed up in a Baptist church and said, hey, guess what? Come Sunday night. Okay. Come Wednesday night. Really? You got something to say? You didn't say enough on Sunday? I mean, you couldn't get it all out on Sunday. Now you want us to come back on Wednesday? You got to be kidding me. I've never gone anywhere but where I wanted to go on a Wednesday night. Then all of a sudden, you know, you go there and you learn a Bible truth and you say, oh, this is pretty good. And then, uh, but at first, it's out of duty. It's out of duty. All these people would say, I serve God because I love God. You grew into that. You grew into that. Uh, I grew into serving God because I loved him. But at first it was duty. Uh, I, I remember going to Bible college and I'm saying, hey, you need to get a Bible college haircut that lines up with the Bible. I didn't know the Bible said anything about hair. So when I went and I got my hair cut, I looked like a bona fide hippie back then. But when I went and got my hair cut, and then I started learning the Bible, hey, wait a minute. I, I learned that God has things to say about everything. And so, uh, but I did it out of duty. I did it out of duty. I come to church, duty. Getting a haircut, duty. Money, ugh. Oh duty can I tell you uh, you want what I thought you owned the, the cattle on a thousand hills what do you need my money for I thought you owned the hills the earth is the Lord's and the food is thereof why do you want my little bitty money uh, God doesn't need your money but you need God God says, I'm just asking you to trust me so I can bless you. I'm trying to help you. And if you don't uh, trust me, how can I help you? So I come to church and all of a sudden I hear the preacher get up. And all he hits is uh, through a message, like I am today. All he hits through a message is tithe, give an offering. I said, oh. I really didn't want to hear that. I came to church to hear about the love of God. I came to church because I'm in trouble. And as I read a moment ago, most people are in trouble when it comes to their finances. So the preacher gets up and he preaches, and I say, okay, okay. Uh, I made $20 this past week, so I put a $2 bill in. I'm going to tie. And so uh, I, I, 
I do what I'm supposed to do. It hurt. I didn't like it. I don't see the benefit of it. But I did what I was supposed to do. Now, by the way, just because you do what you're supposed to do doesn't mean that God is going to bless you. Giving the tithe doesn't mean necessarily that uh, God's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. The Bible says tithe and offer. And so, uh, I, but, but what I do is I, I give and uh, God blessed me. He did. He didn't have to, but he did. And I'm thinking, wow, that's neat. So the next week, uh, instead of making 20 bucks, I make 40. These are $2 bills, just in case you don't know back there. And so, so I, I take and I give, I give $4. And then I, I take and I give a little bit more than that. So I add an offering. I, I hear that the bus ministry needs more gas. We run 11 buses, 11 bus routes, 10 buses. But 11 bus routes, two routes on one bus. Uh, 400 are in the services now other pieces of the property plus the Spanish department plus the special needs department uh, plus some teen services and stuff and hey can I tell you uh, that takes money so I hear about these young people that need to come to church and people that need to come to church and we're going to give them free transportation to come to church but it costs money so God burns my heart and I give then all of a sudden God gives back and then I give and then all of a sudden, God gives back. Then I give. Then God gives back. <laughs> God said, I'll just give you all of it. Now, now, wait a minute. Watch this, if you will. Here's what I understand. I understand the more that I obey God financially, the more that God will bless me. I don't look at me like I'm a, a, you're a calf staring at a new gate. The reason, hold on to that. The reason is because of the fact uh, some of us, we, in something, we trust God to save us. God, give me eternal life. I want to go to heaven. But you can't trust God for your food. You can't trust God for your clothing. You can't trust God that he's going to be good to you and take good care of you. Uh, I learned years ago when I went into the ministry, I have one boss, that's God. Somebody says, who you work for? God. And God uses different people to be a blessing to you along the way. But uh, uh, you understand as we serve the Lord, thank you, be seated, Doc. As we serve the Lord, the Bible says, return unto me and I will return unto you. Listen to your Bible. Uh, Matt, uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 says, You have robbed me, uh, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? So God takes it personal when we don't tithe and give offerings. He says, You're cursed with the curse. So God says that when we don't give the tithes and offerings, he said, I'm going to put a curse on your financial life. Now, by the way, that's not your landlord that's saying that. That's God. The one that owns all. You know, the landlord, don't, don't curse me, but the landlord stand up. Uh, I may owe the landlord something, and I, I'm not able to give him all of it. If he puts a curse on my life, it's not like the God of the universe that does. As I, as I take and I give uh, finances to uh, that which is God, God can touch his heart, but I doubt very seriously if he's going to change God's heart. Watch this. Thank you. Be seated. Uh, Malachi chapter 3 and in verse 9 says, You robbed me, uh, even this whole nation. How is that? Uh, people take their money and they buy cigarettes, but they don't uh, tithe. They don't give an offering. What's that? Uh, that's robbing God. Uh, people take their money. They go gambling. They buy dope. They buy liquor. Uh, wait a minute. Hey, why not use your money wholly before God? Uh, why not decide, hey, I'm going to take and do right by God and let God bless me and let God be the one that can help me because he is the great God of heaven. He is the one that can take and bless you. When you simply do right and just keep doing right, God's not a liar. God can help you. Listen to this. I'm almost done. I said everyone has treasure. Uh, everyone will invest their treasure somewhere. Statement last, and that is this. Everyone will change their heart according to their investment. You know what you're doing uh, coming to church on Sunday morning? 
You've invested your life. You've only got one life. You've only got one life. Soon it'll be passed. You've only got so many days in your life. You've only got so many hours in your life. Here's what you did. You said, God, I love you so much, I'm going to go to church. I love you so much, I want to learn more about your word. God of heaven looks down and says, that's the way you should be. So because you obeyed God, here's what you did. You showed where your treasure is, and eventually it changes your heart. No man that bets on horses does not show up at the horse race to see how it fares. It has his interest. No man that invests in the stock market does not watch the stock market to see how his investment goes. No man that puts hundreds and yea thousands of dollars in golf clubs uh, does not use them from time to time. You see, where your treasure is, that's where you're going to show up eventually. Uh, you show me where your treasure is, eventually I show you where your heart is. First there's treasure, then there's that which is the heart. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of thine increase. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 10, he says this, Then thy barn shall be filled with plenty. It says, And burst out as new wine. Now, wait a minute. You said, uh, 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 Preacher, you're, you're preaching that God is always going to bless. Oh, yeah, I do believe that. I believe that as the children of Israel was on the backside of the desert, God made their shoes last. You say, well, that's not a lot of wealth. He didn't promise you wealth. He promises that he will bless you. For some of us, the blessing is good health. We do right by God. God says, hey, I'm going to help you health. By the way, because of that, you don't pay the doctor bill. Uh, I got this car, and uh, I just, uh, I'm always having trouble with it. You begin to tithe. You begin to give offerings. I don't understand. Now the car's running better. Amen. What is that? God. I just happened to be in the store, and I found that the meat I always enjoy purchasing is on sale, 50% off. Never saw that before. What is that? God. Somebody gave me a coupon. Uh, I was able to save 75% off uh, this suit of clothes I always wanted. Uh, man, God is so good. That's God. I wanted to buy a, 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 a machine. I wanted to get it for my farm. I went out. Uh, it was going to cost $10,000, and I got it for three. What is that? God. I was going to buy a house, and it's like God blinded everybody. Uh, nobody saw it, and I was saving money and saving money, and all of a sudden now, uh, uh, it comes available, and uh, nobody sees it, and they go down, and they go down, and they go down, and all of a sudden, I walk in, and they accept it. What is that, preacher? I'm telling you what that is. That is God. You go to the dentist, and the dentist said, you're a what? Oh, I'm a Christian. Uh, nobody's ever witnessed to me before. You're a what? I'm a Christian. Let me tell you how to be saved. You go to pay your bill. He comes out. He pats you on the shoulder. He says, I've never been witnessed to before. I'll tell you what. I'll just charge you 50% because you're the first one that ever witnessed to me. What is that? God. I was over at Sears. I was witnessing to uh, the men that work there. I've got three men over there. Two of them I had the privilege to lead to Christ. Every time I go to pay my bill, they come up. They say, hey, preacher, let me give you my discount. Let me take care of you. One of them says, it's because of you, heard the gospel, got saved, going to go to heaven. I owe you a debt I'll never be able to repay. What is that? God. Uh, you sit down for a meal. You uh, hold hands with the family. You pray over the meal. You go to pay for the meal, and you find out somebody already paid. God! You know, here's what you do. You say, God, I gave my tithe, gave my offering. I want to see it right there. But God gives back to you over and over and over and over and over again uh, things that you can't describe, things that you can't explain, but it is God. Why? Because you invested in the right place. You become a part of God's investment program, gets God's attention, and God says, I'm going to bless you. 
Now, by the way, that's a promise from God. It's not a promise from man. That's a promise from God. Here it is. Watch this, if you will, as I close. Uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. God says, prove me. He says, when you prove me, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You say, preacher, 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 preacher. I don't think you ought to preach in church on finances. But I love you enough to tell you the truth because I want God to bless you. And unless you learn what God has to say about finances, and I being your pastor, I'm going to be held accountable because God's not using you because you're not doing what you should be doing so that God can bless you. You ever see a rebellious kid? I'm talking about a Walmart brat. Say, so how did he get that way? Nobody helped him. Nobody corrected him. Nobody disciplined him. Nobody gave him direction. Now he's grown up, and all the Walmarts call each other. He's in our store today. <laughs> Hello. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. He says uh, uh, that you'll not have room enough to receive it. Here's what we try and do. We try and work out our own problems. Well, you know, preacher, I can't tithe this week because uh, I had a phone bill. I had a doctor's bill. And then that tells me you're not trusting God. You put him first always. Always. And then he will help you. He'll show you things. That's the big thing about trust. You have a sore back. You're sick. Stand up. So here I am. Uh, you need your Bible gone. Okay, here I am. We're going to do this right here. You got me? I, I have lost weight. Okay. I want you to know that. All right. Then I gained double back. Here we go. Right? So I'm walking along. I'm trusting God. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. All of a sudden, calamity comes. Calamity comes. And then I can still trust God. Say, God, hey, your word, your word, your word. God from heaven looks down and says, you're going to trust me even though calamity comes? You're going to trust me even though problems come? Are you going to trust me? And then I fail the test and I fall. Does God hold me up? Yeah, God holds me up. But God won't give me the blessings he promised. He'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's always going to be there. Okay? But if I want more blessing, I want God to bless me more, then I obey him more. It's the guy that obeys the boss more that gets the bonuses and the raises. Where do you think that came from? God's economy. As a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Oh, you don't understand. I just can't, I can't trust him because I'm scared. I'm sorry. But somewhere along the line, you're going to have to build your faith that you can trust God because he's trustworthy. Watch this. Thank you. Be seated. Here it is. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 11. God says when we do right, he'll rebuke the devourer, the devourer for our sake. God says that he'll give good fruit. God said he'll bless the nation. God said the land will be a delightsome land. Uh, the last verse I'll read. Well, next to the last verse I'll read. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6, the Bible says, He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. When, we, when I came up on that 180-acre farm in Millers, Maryland, when we went out and we sowed seed into the field, guess what? We always reaped in the harvest time. We didn't sow seed in the field. We didn't reap in harvest time. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure uh, that ye, listen to it now, with the same measure that ye meet, wherewithal shall it be measured to you again. So here's a person, uh, they go down to the sea, 
They go over here, if you would please, uh, maybe to one of the ports that we have where uh, uh, the water's coming in, there's the lake there, whatever, and they take a little thimble. They say, here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to use my thimble, and I'm going to get as much as you would give me. Well, with the same way that they measured it is the same way it's measured back to them. Now, God's going to keep his word. It's going to be pressed down. It's going to be running over. But the same way you measure it is the same way God measures it back to you. Go down to the pond, if you will, uh, and, and you take a six-liter bottle. You put it in there. Got it. You're not going to fit seven liters of water in a six-liter bottle. The same way you measure it to God, the same way God measures it to you. You take a gallon bucket, same way you measure it to God, same way God measures it to you. Take a 50-gallon drum, same way you measure it to God, same way God measures it to you. you take a seven-story apartment building that's a capsule to be able to fill it up. It's waterproof, nothing spewing out the windows or the doors. You fill it up, same way you measure, the same way you do. It just depends. Now, by the way, you can't start off this way because you don't have it. But the way to be able to grow in your giving is to start. You have to start. God cannot trust you with much until you prove yourself that he can trust you with little. If he can't trust you with little, he's not going to trust you with much. So what are you doing with the little that you have? Somebody said, well, if I had a million dollars, man, I'd give $100,000 to the church, to God's work. Great. Appreciate the remarkable attitude. Now, here's my question. What are you doing with the dollar you got? When your children are young, that's the time to teach them to trust God. We taught our kids when they were very young, used to put the tithe the offering in jars. We taught the envelope system here, as I've taught on finances many times. We teach them when they're young. You know why? Because one day they're going to be old. And God will only bless them to the proportion that they learn to trust him in every area of life. Listen to me, folks. That includes your finances. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.